Thank you so much for coming. I'm so delighted to be here at Sophia's book launch. How cool is that? <laughs> so cool. Um, Sophia and I actually have a lot of things in common. I don't know if you've ever seen us in a room together. People often mistake us for, for the other. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> All the time. Um, when I got a copy of this um, manuscript, I was so incredibly impressed by it. And I think that what happens is that when you know a person like Sophia, who is famous for other things, she's a very famous literary citizen who's incredibly generous and smart, and she makes a community, and she supports so many artists, you don't know what kind of work she's doing because she doesn't talk about herself. And then you're lucky enough to read a manuscript like this, and you go, whoa, she's a great artist. And it's such a relief. It's such a... <laughs> No, it's a relief because you're thinking, oh my God, how about if it sucks? <laughs> then what do I do? But this is such a beautiful book because it has that really special thing where you can have both the whole range of emotions. You feel amusement, you feel tragedy, you feel loss, you feel a longing, a lot of longing. And that's the thing that I really connected with in this book. So I was hoping that we could do two tiny, tiny readings. So. Sophia will read for us first, because for those of you who don't know a lot about the idea of Yugoslavia and the dissolution of Yugoslavia, I have asked Sophia to read a tiny bit for us. Yes, so this is from the very beginning. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, can you see why I'm basically in love with Min Jin Lee? <laughs> okay. All right, so this is at the very beginning. <clears throat> Prologue, Princess of Disaster. I wouldn't normally enter, oh, I was gonna stand at the podium, wasn't I? Because we were saying how I'll probably drop the book because I'm not uh, coordinated. Here we go. This is, <laughs> trust me, this will, this will work better. I'll give you this one. Smooth. <laughs> I wouldn't normally enter a beauty pageant, but this one is special. It's a battle for the title of Miss X Yugoslavia beauty queen of a country that no longer exists. It is due to the country being no more that our shoddy little contest is happening in Australia, over 8,000 miles from where Yugoslavia once stood. My fellow competitors, competitors and I are immigrants and refugees coming from different sides of the conflict that split Yugoslavia up. It's a weird idea for a competition bringing young women from a war-torn country together to be objectified, but in our little diaspora, we are used to contradictions. It's 2005, I'm 22, and I've been living in Australia for most of my life. I'm at Joy, an empty Melbourne nightclub that smells of stale smoke and is located above a fruit and vegetable market. I open the door to the dressing room, and when my eyes adjust to the fluorescent lights, I see that young women are rubbing olive oil on each other's thighs. <laughs> Apparently, this is a trick used in real competitions, one we've hijacked for our amateur version. For weeks, I've been preparing myself to stand almost naked in front of everyone I know, and it's come around quick. As I scan the shiny bodies for my friend Nina, I'm dismayed to see that all the other girls have dead straight hair, while mine, thanks to an overzealous hairdresser with a curling wand, looks like a wig made of sausages. <laughs> Dodi Lutko, come here, doll, Nina says, as she emerges from the crowd of girls. Maybe we can straighten it. She brings her hand up to my hair cautiously, as if petting a startled lamb. <laughs> Nina is a Bosnian refugee in a miniskirt. As a contestant, she is technically my competitor, but we've become close in the rehearsals leading up to the pageant. Under Nina's tentative pets, the hair doesn't give. It's been sprayed to stay like this, possibly forever. <laughs> I shift uncomfortably and tug on the hem of my skirt, trying to pull it lower. Just like the hair, it does not budge. In my language, such micro mini skirts have earned their own graphic term, dopichnyak which literally means to the pussy, a precise term, a precise term to distinguish the dorpichniak from its more conservative subgenital cousin, the miniskirt. <laughs> Though several of us barely speak our mother tongue, all of us competitors are ex-Yugos, for better or worse. 
We come from Bosnia, Croatia, Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia and Slovenia. I join a conversation in which Yugo girls are yelling over one another in slang riddled English, recalling munching on the salty peanut snack smoky, which you can help yourselves to, it's at the back. <laughs> recalling munching on the salty peanut snack smoky when they were little, agreeing that it was the bomb and totally sick, superior to anything one might find in our adoptive home of Australia. The idea of a beauty pageant freaks me out, and ex-Yugoslavia as a country itself is an oxymoron. But the combination of the two makes the deliciously weird Miss Ex-Yugoslavia competition the ideal subject for my documentary film class. I feel like a double agent. Yes, I am part of the ex-Yugo community. Quiet, you. <laughs> That's my baby. I wasn't just yelling at someone else. <laughs> That would have been really inappropriate. Um, but I can do whatever. It's like my baby. I, can. Um, I will beat him after. Um, I feel like a double agent. Yes, I am part of the ex Hugo community. But also, I am a cynical, story hungry, Western schooled film student. And so I've gone undercover among my own people. I know my community is strange and I want to get top marks for this exclu exclusive glimpse within. Though I've been deriding the competition to my film student friends, rolling my eyes at the ironies, I have to admit that this pageant and its resurrection of my zombie country is actually poking at something deep. If I'm honest with myself, I'm not just a filmmaker seeking a story. This is my community. I want outsiders to see the human face of ex-Yugoslavia because it's my face and the face of these girls. We're more than news reports about war and ethnic cleansing. So we know stories about beauty pageants, but we don't know the story about this kind of beauty pageant because it's a really lovely metaphor, right? Of trying to understand how we can accept something that's so important post-diaspora. So I was just curious what you could, it's okay, I know, I'll let her talk in a second. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could tell me what you feel when you meet people from this idea of ex-Yugoslavia in America. Yeah, so, I mean, ex-Yugoslavia is such a s strange concept, right? So it used to be a country and it, it's not a country anymore. But for those of us uh, in the immigrant community that I grew up with, it's something that we feel a lot of nostalgia for. And sometimes I think about that, like that idea of home. If I go to Belgrade, which is where I was born, if I go back there now, it doesn't actually feel like my home. My home is something that no longer exists. So this idea of ex-Yugoslavia, it's not a real place, but it's a place that I feel really connected to. And it makes me think about like the idea that home isn't a physical space for me anymore, but it's something that is in my, my memories. And I talk about that a lot. I think it's the experience for, I think that's the experience of a lot of immigrants living oh, overseas as well. Absolutely. Actually, you wrote here on page 248, I wanted to live in places that no longer existed with people who were gone. Yeah, that's a bit sad, but it's true. <laughs> it's true. I think that's a big. I think that's a big part of of being. I mean, maybe it's just part of being a human, really, uh, and a nostalgic human, which I very much am. And when you talk about like the longing in the book, I uh, think about things that used to happen all the time you know the, the the my happiest moments are when I was a child, and a lot of that is sort of weaved in throughout the book. And I do, I, I'm a big fat nostalgic who cries all the time about things that happened in the past. And this is basically a book about me being an oversensitive kid, uh, being in kind of humorous and silly situations, but being at the same time very nostalgic for both a place and a time that no longer exist. But I think that it's more than silly. It is, it's a lot more than that. Because and I think for me, what I connected with is idea that you are willing to talk about things that are really uncomfortable, that you have these six countries, these, mm. these six nations now, right? And we have to deal with each other. So I'm always amazed that I didn't know there are white people until I went to college. 
Mm -hmm. So when I went to college, and I went to a very fancy college called Yale, you might have heard of it. <laughs> and when I got there, there were white people. And because in Queens, there were Irish people, Polish people, Greek people, Italian people, uh -huh. and Serbians, and Czech, and Hungarian. So that was really interesting to me. But and every single person had a different history and opinion and stereotypes about each group. So how do you deal with that? With the stereotypes, yeah. th there's certainly uh, lots of them. And it's really hard. I think that that's something that I try to deal with all the time is how to um, uh, sort of, you feel the, the weight of your community on you as well. And I'm sure that you feel this as well in your writing. Like, when you come from, from a community that is sort of a microcosm within, so this like ex Hugo community was a tiny world within uh, this large world of Australia and we were a, an ethnic minority and you kind of feel like uh, you represent those people as well. So it's, it's very tough, uh, but at the same time, you know, throughout my life I've tried to work out what my identity is and I wonder whether I work it out in the book or not. I don't know. Oh, I thought you worked it out really well and I thought you were really honest about it. So this is my big question. Okay. When you watch the Olympics, who do you root for? <laughs> You should have seen me. You should have seen me. Actually, World Cup soccer, um, Australia playing Serbia. It was like I, you, I had a group of friends who I watched generally sports with, and I couldn't. I was just by myself. I was very upset because it was like it was a no-win situation. Whoever won, whoever lost, it would have just been uh, disastrous, and it was disastrous. Uh, so I can't do it. I don't know. I don't know. I'm still. I, I try and like say, you know, I am a citizen of the world, but. I don't think that really works when you actually come from somewhere. So yeah, I'm I'm Serbian, I'm Yugoslavian, I'm Australian. So, but do you ever find yourself defending your position as a Serb versus, let's say, a Bosnian? Or I mean, there's a lot of incredibly painful history yeah. here in this war. So, how do you deal with that? There is. I, I, it's something that I that I talk about in the book. It because it was it was so it was one of the kind of bloodiest, most awful conflicts in recent history in Europe. It went for about a decade. Uh, and it was something that I experienced in this very strange way. So, so we weren't part, we weren't in the war. My family weren't refugees. Uh, we left before the war started. My parents got a professional visa. And the way that I experienced the war was kind of secondhand, watching my parents who were watching the TV and the news and, and crying and... Um, yelling at each other and arguing and so it was I feel like that war was something that was a shadow that existed throughout my whole life but it's also something that I don't feel um, qualified to uh, have a strong opinion on so as a child an immigrant child which I was it was something that um, I constantly battled with and I didn't really know how to deal with and I still don't know I mean yeah I, I think taking I think one of the things uh, that I find interesting is that all these issues and, and war, it's a lot more complicated than how it seems. So one of the things that, that I talk about in the book as well is that it's not just black and white, there are good guys and there are bad guys. And often on the news, there was one like world news program in Australia that we watched. Um, and from that, you know, it would be like, these are the good guys, these are the bad guys. And that's the two minutes of talking finished. And Actually, it's a lot more complicated than that, of course. Like, uh, we were Serbs and uh, my family were against Slovoda Milosevic. That's why we left Yugoslavia. So um, I guess the complexities are there and that was something that I also tried to explore in the book. But mainly it's just anecdotes about what happened to me as a kid and all this stuff is going on in the background, I feel. Well, that's what I really liked about it, is the fact that you have this incredibly complex, very painful history in the background, mm. and yet you have this young girl who is getting tested for STDs. <laughs> I mean, that's important, right? Yeah, it's important. it's important to get tested for STDs. All of you should be tested for STDs regularly. It's if, if you take <laughs> anything away from this evening. Yeah. <laughs> that was my public service announcement for tonight. <laughs> yes, uh. if you guys want to be on Tinder, please get tested. Um, I mean, that happens towards the end of the book. The book starts with, like, me being born, so that didn't, like, happen for a little while. The yes, it's just spoiler <laughs> alert. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, like, little things that happen. I think that, that it's, like, little small stories that happen throughout my life, and then, um, yes, you kind of, like, see the big picture, but through these, these small stories that I tell. So I guess, yes, one of them is um, a sex one. 
idea. <laughs> or the idea that you could, because you seem so intellectual and artistic to thank me. Thank you, thank you for yes. saying that. <laughs> <laughs> so when I read the initial part when she said she actually had to get out there in front of a, with a bikini, in a nightclub, and I, of course you could see and smell this nightclub when you're reading Sophia's wonderful prose, and I literally felt frightened for you. Were you afraid? Yeah. So the book, the, the, that's the start of the book, is this competition that I um, entered, and then um, to sort of e explore my community. That was kind of the idea behind it, but I did actually compete as a contestant, and it was really, really weird, as you can imagine. And I'm not going to tell you if I won or not. <laughs> I'll let you read the book. So may I ask, <laughs> I thought since uh, not all of us have had the opportunity to read the book yet, I thought maybe I can ask you questions about being a writer. Yes. Now, when you decided to write a memoir, what were you thinking? Like, said, oh, I, I really want to write this story? Or how did you know what story you wanted to work on? Well, when I moved to New York about four years ago, I... Um, went to a moth storytelling night and that's where you just get up on stage and you tell a story from your life. And I always felt like a, a little bit shy or embarrassed to do something like that when I lived in Australia. Um, and I've also always struggled a little bit with, you know, having English as a second language and, and uh, wondering, you know, am I good enough to do this? Will people care about my stories? And then New York is such a crazy city and everyone is here. As, as you know, like New York has this very interesting kind of welcoming attitude but also people just do whatever the hell they want and I think I was at this place and I was like I don't know anyone I can just get up and you know tell a little story from my life and it was one of those it was like me as this um you know ex-Yugoslavian kid in Australia doing something and I thought why would Americans care about this but they did they they were really interested and I think that they may be connected with that idea of an outsider um or someone trying to fit in I think that's something that people can identify with and because I got such nice encouragement from that I was like oh maybe I'll do a bit of doodling maybe I'll write a little couple of things in my notebook and then yeah it kept going. So did you have any of the anxiety of like what will people say because that's what usually stops a lot of writers yes. from writing memoirs like how did you deal with that or did you not have those anxieties? No 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 I <laughs> still have those anxieties. Um, and Just buy the book don't read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was like, yeah, I don't know how you deal with it. I guess it's, you know, uh, it feels like you feel very, very vulnerable when you write a memoir, I, I think, or at least I have. I can only speak from my experience. It feels like putting out um, something that is very personal, like a baby, and then just like throwing it out into the world and strangers can just like, I don't know, kick it around or whatever. That's actually what it feels like. So it's, it's very intense in that way. But then at the same time, I have to think maybe – there's something to be found in these stories that is interesting to people and that's important and that I needed to say. And in the end, writing, whether it's memoir or not, is in some ways art, I guess, and you can separate from it in a way. So it's like this is a version of certain things that happened and now I'm done with them. So it is absolutely art. Yes. I want you to own that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and may I please ask you to read the scene? Oh, yeah, I'll read another one. Oh, okay, so this one is about... Um, let me tell you what this one is about. I'll leave the microphone. Okay, I'll tell you on the other one. What the <laughs> well, so this is... Um, soon after we arrived in Australia, after we arrived in Australia, I had a lot of trouble fitting in to school. So I couldn't speak English. And I was five when we first came. And... Um, I had been really good at my own language, Serbo-Croatian. I'd been like a really fast learner and I could conjugate all these um, words and my parents and their friends were so impressed that I was like really clever and I was very proud of myself. And then we came to Australia and I didn't know anything. And at school, like kids laughed at me and called me names and I didn't have uh, any friends at the beginning. I had, like I was friends with these, this is like, a rather sad uh, aspect. There were these farm animals that were on our school that were like <laughs> fenced off and I would like pretend to feed them. I would like feed them through the fence to pretend that I had friends when I didn't actually have any friends. So that like picture that sort of pathetic scene and me trying really hard to fit in. Um, and then, uh, and my mother felt really sorry for me. So my mother had through my first five years done everything she could to like protect me 
from the world. She was a psychologist. She worked at Belgrade University. She did all these like weird tests on me. She protected me from every. She like told me about Santa Claus so I wouldn't find out from other children <laughs> when I was really, really young. And so we get to Australia and suddenly she was very helpless as well because there was language issues. We were just in the middle of um, a place we had knew nothing about. Like my mum referred to Australia as the asshole of the world because it was so far away from where we came from. And so we'd go to school every morning and I would cry about, um, you know, what, would, what might happen at school and she would sort of cry along with me because she felt so bad for me. Uh, Okay, so this is just about her and I having a bit of a language misunderstanding. To encourage my ESL education, I was allowed to watch as much English language television as I wanted. As soon as I got home, on came Play School, Sesame Street, Monkey Magic and Masters of the Universe. Not only did these shows provide me with entertainment, joy and linguistic skills that I desperately needed, they also offered the beautiful and comforting formula of beginnings, middles and ends. I recognised the formula from books, films and the stories I'd heard from Grandma Xenia. And even though I didn't know all the words, I could make predictions based on my knowledge of storytelling and learning English became less of a chore, more of an adventure. Watching TV brought some order into the chaos. I turned into a devoted couch potato. The screen became my most loved teacher. By the time my first school term was ending, I spoke English fluently and my parents' pride at my genius swelled once again. I warmed to my teacher, Mrs Melville, when I found that teachers in Australia lavished far more praise on students than my Belgrade teacher, Madame Marie, with her half-hearted handing out of heart-shaped stickers. Children were commended not just for correct answers, but for just trying, and in fact, <laughs> While Madame Marie would deal in absolutes, correct and incorrect, Mrs Melville would dole out the term, nice try, in a way that didn't make you feel foolish. I stopped being afraid to use trial and error, and I began to talk, sitting happily right up front, no longer terrified of making mistakes. One particular day, I had managed to engage in a full conversation with other kids about Masters of the Universe, opining on the hero He-Man and his nemesis Skeletor. No one laughed and the other children offered the respect my observations deserved. <laughs> I was excited to tell my mother about it as we walked home under blooming bottle brush bushes while Natalia gurgled in her stroller. In rapid fire Serbian, I launched into my story. Today, the kids were talking about He-Man and I joined in. I expected my mother to break out into applause or high five me. What? She said instead, sharply. The kids were talking about He-Man and I joined in. <laughs> oh my God, she said, in the way that she did when someone mentioned something about the hole in the ozone layer that she was paranoid about. She stopped pushing the stroller. This I did not expect, she said, sighing. And I tried to work out what I had done wrong. What those children were talking about she said, looking me in the eye and putting her hand on my shoulder like she had done when she told me that Grandpa had died, is a thin membrane covering <laughs> a woman's vagina which is penetrated by a man's penis when she has sex for the first time. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, God, I thought, what? My rudimentary picture of the human anatomy was enriched in my mind's eye as these new and cruel elements she had described were added to it. A giant rocket-style penis, for one. My mother sighed. I am surprised that those children are talking about advanced sexual concepts, but you know I have always been straightforward with you. Now you know, she said, in the same no-nonsense tone she'd used when telling me that Santa Claus didn't exist. The word he-man to my mother, who was more familiar with academic language than with popular culture, sounded an awful lot like hymen, and her anxious mind had gone right there. He-man, I said weakly. <laughs> His sister is she -ra. Oh, she said, the penny dropping. As she remembered the show I watched, right. Then, then cheerfully, forget what I just said. <laughs> So, you joined in talking about a television show and the other children were receptive. Great work. <laughs> but it was, of course, too late for praise. 
So it was that my mother, whose goal was to protect me from trauma, presented me with some terrifying truths. There was such a thing as a hymen, it could be penetrated by a penis, and there was nothing he-man could do to stop it. <laughs> Instead of walking home crying or talking over each other like we'd done so many times before, we walked in stunned silence. <laughs> Isn't that great? I love that. I was so happy when Sophia said she would read that section. Okay, but going back to that section, my big question for you is narrative, right? So I want you to sort of share with us, because I don't know, for, the, for those of you who don't know, Sophia has created, well, she was half of Women of Letters in Australia, and then you created half Women of Letters in New York. And then, so, right. yeah, Women of Letters started in Australia, and then when I moved here, the people who created it asked me to host the, it here as right. well. So I just got to like jump on the bandwagon. I didn't actually get to create it. Okay. Sorry. Well, you created it for us in New York. <laughs> yes. You made it happen. Yes. So, and for those of you who don't know, they ask a, um, a writer to come up and read a letter out loud based upon a theme that Sophia kind of tells you as a guerrilla tactic. You just don't know what you're going to do and then you're like, oh my god, I'm going to write about envy or something or taboos. And um, then you created Alienation, mm -hmm. right? So one of the things that I notice about your what you do as an artist is you are making narrative and you are celebrating narrative. So about that scene, which obviously got, got lots of laughs, mm -hmm. it's really quite touching, isn't it? And I want to ask you, what do you think about, because you actually said making design out of chaos. Can mm. you tell me what, you, what narrative means for you in all the dislocations that you've had? To me, that's a really good question. To me, narrative is hugely important and I love it. Like as a kid, I loved watching films. I really liked uh, Disney films. I really liked books. I really, I, I felt a lot of um, comfort in the, sort of predictable formula of narrative that has like a beginning and a middle and an end. And I think it's something that I, that I love. Like I also tell stories with the moth and they're very, you know, generally that they very much have like that story structure. And I think that I use it to make sense of a lot of things that happen in my life. So a lot of um, the story is anecdotes that follow a kind of narrative arc and to, and to me it, it was very important especially with learning language like I, I say in this um, it helped me a lot is that does that answer your question oh it does I think what's what I was sort of struck by is what makes a person this invested in narrative right yeah because you are not just doing written narrative you are getting out there in front of people and giving narrative by voicing mm. it. And that's a very different thing. Mm. So how do you find the experience of speaking narrative versus writing narrative? Because it takes a different kind of person to do well in both. I don't know. I think that I'm just obsessed with it. I think I find a lot of comfort in it. And I think it helps me to make sense of the world and of chaos. Uh, and when you don't have that much control. I guess as a kid, my family moved us around a lot and there were things that I that I couldn't help that happened um, in my life, including like, um, you know, family tragedy and, and, and all sorts of things, including, you know, dealing with like who I was, where I came from. And I feel that narrative and stories and storytelling helped me a lot with that. So I think that's actually the way I express myself, whether it's in writing or whether it's in storytelling, I, I feel comfort in it. I like... Um, you know, rambling stories as well, or uh, but I identify more with and prefer the ones that have, you know, shape. Yeah. So, do you think that comes from your grandmother, your mother, or your father? Or oh, everyone? I think yeah. And, and that's they're all covered in this book. Yeah. yeah, they're all covered in this book. It's also, I don't know. I th I think that the stories. I don't know whether this is true. Are there any ex Yugoslavians here? Okay. I don't know whether you would agree with me, but I feel like there are lots of there is a storytelling culture as well in our um, history and 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 in songs and in in stories as well that that we tell. And when I was little, my grandmother used to tell me a lot of stories from her life, uh, as did my mother and and everyone. So, yeah, I think that. What was the initial question? <laughs> 
before I pointed out the ex Yugos. Oh, I was trying to figure out who influenced you. Oh, yeah, everyone, all of those people in the culture. Okay. Great. And Disney films a lot. And Disney, <laughs> yes. I or, used to watch them before I knew English. Or all the mothers are dead. <laughs> All the what? All the mothers are dead. Well, whose mothers? The Disney mothers? Yeah, most of the Disney mothers are dead. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Bambi's mother is dead. <laughs> There's more. <laughs> <laughs> I know that Dumbo's mother gets shackled and that was very sad. She didn't die, though. Maybe I had a censored version, now I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So... <laughs> I'm going to cry now. No, no, don't, please. Uh, you can if you like. I was hoping that I could open this up now for you guys because Sophia is really fun. Do we have any questions? Yes? So when you got into a studio, was there a Yugoslav community? Or were they immediately split into Serbs, Croats, Macedonia? No, there was a Yugoslav community. Okay. Sorry. I'm sorry, sorry. What's your name? Wayne. Wayne. So Wayne's question, for those of you who didn't hear it, is... Um, when we got to Yugoslavia, was it uh, uh, Australia? Was it a community of Yugoslavians, or were they split into uh, the various uh, groups that? Yeah. And had the Serbian football team and the Croatian football. Team. Yeah. So when we got to Australia, Yugoslavia was still a country. Uh, so it was a Yugoslavian community, and we were part of uh, the brain drain that started before the Yugoslavian wars. So the um, people from ex-Yugoslavia in Australia had come in the in the 60s, and quite a lot before us. We came in the late 80s, so they had either been capitalists or or uh, royalists or people who didn't like Marshal Tito, who was in charge. Uh, and they had their own community, which was very different, and my parents felt very disconnected from it because they had already been in Australia for 20 or 30 years. So we came as, like, the first wave. My dad thought there's something's going to happen here, and he kind of coerced very much against my mother's wishes because she loved Belgrade, where we came from, and he sort of made us go to Australia. So this was before the wars even began and they felt very strange in this community. However, once the war started, people started coming in from, from Croatia and from Bosnia uh, mostly. that They were the largest groups because they were refugees from the war. Uh, and then there were people who were, who were nationalists. But I'd say the group that we belong to are these people who have this Yugo nostalgia, who still remember the country as it was and therefore who would participate in a Miss X Yugoslavia competition weird as it sounds yeah. also your father was really advanced in other things like professionally with technology right he yeah. was very ahead of other people H i mean where does that come from it was well, he was like a computers guy um and there was a lot of uh both Canada and America and Australia were looking for really like this idea of Eastern and Southern European tech guys because because they were very good and there was really great engineering courses and and um, interesting things happening there. So he knew that his skills he didn't get much money in socialist Yugoslavia and he knew that he could get a job easily somewhere else. And I think he thought that the weather in Australia was better and the visas were faster to get than here or in Canada. So that's how we ended up there. So was it just a matter of chance between Australia and the US? Because you could have been Serbian-American versus yeah. Serbian-Australian. Yeah, and I wouldn't have this delightful accent for you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't be any fun. <laughs> yes. Hi, I just wanted to ask, you talked about how the moth kind of inspired you to start talking here, but I'm wondering whether being in the US had how much that influenced the writing that you were kind of away from Australia and where your own childhood was? Yes, I think so. I think getting away from my family as well. A lot of this book is, uh, you know, that, that my I talk a lot about my family and I think that being away from them and also missing them helped. There's like a sort of strain of nostalgia that runs through this, but also I had to, uh, yeah, kind of deal with things on my own and far away. That did That, that was really important, being somewhere new and different and letting go a little bit because I'm also a bit wound up like it's hard for me to you know how there are these people who are like wildly creative who can just be like I'm just gonna sit down and write a I, I'm more of like oh I don't know I don't know if I should be doing this so yeah being far away from familiar things helped me get a bit more guts 
Uh, I'm one of the ex Yugoslavs. <laughs> Hi. I was just wondering, I sort of, I had a very similar childhood, except I ended up moving uh, to Chicago as a child from Belgrade. I was just wondering sort of how you reconcile, you know, you mentioned you were very good when you were a child speaking Serbian, and then you moved to Australia, and suddenly English was a problem. I find the same, but then, you know, these days when I go back to Belgrade, I can't be as expressive in Serbian, for yeah. example. So it's a very sort of... Uh, strange feeling for me because there is no sort of like this is my home this is yeah it's really strange because it's also in Australia I'm like the most Serbian person all of my friends know so they're like she's Serbian Sofia the Serbian while in Serbia they're like oh you're like an Australian you don't really fit in here and you don't fit in there for me also as a, I, I'm not sure what um whether you find this professionally as well but also as a writer it does a little bit suck being a writer and and not being like top of English or top of Serbian because I feel like you know I, I can write a book in English but it's in a very specific way that that I think is the way that my language has developed um, so the way that I express myself is um, definitely influenced by the the fact that I had another language first and of course yeah I read uh, in English I prefer reading in English than in Serbian I only speak Serbian to my family and, and some friends mainly I speak English and it's, yeah, it's tough. It's weird because you don't belong in either place. And that's, I think that's what I deal with a lot in the book, how I think a lot of immigrant kids feel like that. And maybe not just kids, but like kids of immigrants. And When you speak Serbian, do you still feel like a child? Because you left when you were a child? When I speak Serbian, do I feel like a child? Because I left when I was a child. I don't think so, but probably if I thought about it, if I like did some inward looking, maybe, because uh, usually I speak so to my mother, so I guess that, you know, there's that dynamic there. Hi. Um, was there a certain point that you felt more comfortable identifying as Serbian over Yugoslavian? Or do you still feel like because you left Yugoslavia when it was Yugoslavia that you are more Yugoslavian because that was your experience? Um, generally when people ask me I say that I'm Serbian because that's the, the name of the place now and also there are plenty of reasons why, um, you know, the, the wars... I, I don't want to deny that the wars happened because they were horrible. Uh, and sometimes I identify more like in sporting situations and things like that, um, more as Serbian because we have our own uh, teams. And also during the, there's one part of the book where there's the NATO bombing of Serbia. And that's where I suddenly start to connect a lot more with uh, both the community that, that I was part of and I start hanging out a lot more with uh, Serbs because I was friends with Aussies a lot more and then I felt like my Australian friends didn't really understand what was happening there wasn't much sympathy from the Australian government either um, and suddenly I felt very much on the outside and then I embraced my Serbianness a lot more. Is there any, maybe this is in the book, but is there any deliberate resonance between like your initial framing of the beauty pageant and Miss Sarajevo 1996? No it's not intentional. I mean uh, yeah, no. What impact do you want the book to have on the people who read it? Oh, that's a really good one. I think that's how that you're meant to think of that like before you pitch it as well. <laughs> um, I would I think I think that immigrant voices are really important. And I think that nowadays we don't really... The immigration is a really big topic, right? And there are people who are like for it and against it and generally there are sound bites on the news. I think it's really important to hear the voices of people who have had an immigrant experience uh, because they're very varied. And mine is a very personal one, but I feel like maybe it will help people... Some people will identify with it and some people will gain like a little bit more understanding. But I think that's the the best that I can hope for, that people feel uh, like they've just learned a little bit more about an aspect of life or, or a person who, who they wouldn't normally have considered. I think that, yeah, I think that our voices aren't heard as much as maybe they should be. You Do know, you agree? Well, yeah. absolutely. But I, I guess I was thinking about this a lot when I was reading your work is that we, we know so little about Serbians mm. as people. 
as, as young girls who want to be artists, young girls who have fears, young girls who don't know how to make friends or talk to farm animals. Like, we, don't, we don't know this girl. And, but at the same time, she's, just, she's a girl, but she's also Serbian, she's also Australian, she's also now American. And I was just curious, how do you feel about like, where you fit in the best at this point? Where I fit in as ethnically or just? In terms of your identity. Yeah, I think I'm always struggling a little bit with my identity, but I think much less so now that I've finished writing this. So I think that as a child I had a lot, I, I felt like I had to identify in a certain way and, that, and also when you identify with a certain group, it's, it's very hard. And it was especially hard for me during, um, you know, when I was a kid when Yugoslavia was at war because identifying as a Serbian person, you're basically... Pe what people associate with that, it was Slobodan Milosevic who was, you know, oh. terrible. Um, so it was, it's very hard to identify. But now, now I feel like um, I have the ability to be an individual within this rather than, rather than uh, letting it sort of envelop me too much. Do you feel like, especially now that the book is out, that you have a sense of representation um, burden right now or no? Yes. Yeah, but yeah, th th you mean that I feel like I represent all young, right? Yeah, yes, I do feel that, but I don't think that I should. I think that ideally, I would just be like, "Hey, this is my story," but I, I do feel that. I think that all writers feel that. Do you, d I, I, have you all read Min's book Pachinko, which is really amazing? But do you feel I am curious about that as well because you wrote about Koreans in Japan, and there haven't been other books written about that. I feel the burden of representation all the time. Yeah. I mean, it's actually quite intense. I can barely get out of bed in the morning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and people often ask me questions, and I'm just curious if people will ask you questions or they have asked you questions as you go on your tour. Mm. More questions about this history because mm -hmm. you're going to have to field them. I get questions like, what are Koreans like? Mm. And what do you say? Do you say delightful? <laughs> <laughs> I, tell, I usually say they like to dance. Oh, that's good. Yeah, and nobody believes me. <laughs> but if and you then know, you dance, and, and then, then you're I like, dance. oh, really? <laughs> then the lights go down. Right, exactly. <laughs> but it's funny to me, but I think that when you do create a work, people do think that somehow you are representing this mm. entire group, and then also other people who disagree with your vision mm -hmm. will tell you. It's unfortunate, isn't yes. it? Yes, <laughs> I've had people tell me I disagree. <laughs> and I go, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, I, I would like to you to coach me on this because I don't know. I don't know how you deal with that. And it is, you know, like th there are so many people, like I was saying, there are so many people in the world who have their own individual voices and everyone wants, a and most people aren't heard, right? So this is very lucky, like having a book. And you do feel like, oh, okay, what am I going to do with this power that I have? Um, you know, like what is the, what do you hope for people to take away from it? And it's very tricky because... You, you're like, I want to solve the problems of the world. You're like, world peace. Like, it's very hard. I do want that, by the way. You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> you could do it, Sophia. I know you can. Um, okay. Any more questions? Yes. Oh, sorry. This one? Um, uh, since you're a new mother now, um, I, I guess, like, how do you think motherhood will play? Like, how does your identity and your cultural background will play into how yeah, so I'm hoping that he won't have the the same sort of burdens as I do because he's only like half ex-Yugoslavian. <laughs> uh, but I also want him to have, um, you know, I, I want that part that my culture is part of his life as well because he's growing up in a Western society and, and I don't want that to be lost. So in some ways I'm getting more Yugo a little bit, like I, I'm – into all these like little cultural things that I never used to be into because I'm like, I want him to, I don't want this to be lost. You know, I imagine I speak to him in Serbian and, and things like that. Uh, but I also don't want him to be burdened in the way I guess that uh, a lot of immigrant kids are because he's, he's not. So he's like half Aussie, half Serbian, I guess. He has a, his last name is a combination of the two. So it's like made up. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't have to be anything yeah but I think that motherhood like okay fine now that you've asked me about motherhood as well I'll just I was like I'm not going to talk about my baby but now you know when you have a little baby and you're like mothers with babies are so boring why do they always talk about their babies and now I'm like let me tell you um actually 
It's funny. I have a really dear friend who has an only child, mm. a son, and I have a son, and we both have only children. And she said to me, I think my son is fascinating. <laughs> and I said, I think my son is fascinating. And we both just kind of agreed that we're losers, but... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but when you become a parent, your kid is so fascinating to you. Yes. It's kind of amazing. And hopefully, I'm hoping because this has, you know, my whole life I've talked about stories about being a little kid, and I actually feel like I'm 35 years old. I feel like this is me growing up. I know it's taken like it's taken a little while. Usually people do it when they're like 18 or something. Like that's the general time that people grow up but I really feel like having a baby and writing this down finally is like my coming of age <laughs> and then maybe I'll start talking about something else now apart from like the farm animals and he-man <laughs> etc and then maybe I'll be more interesting company <laughs> I'll You're doing very well. You're doing very I'm even well. drinking alcohol did you guys have the uh rakia Shlivovica? They were very supportive. So it's my mother and my sister um, and they both read the book and were – they've been extremely supportive like my, my, my whole life. And I think my mother's a pretty big character in the book. Uh, I think she comes across pretty good though. I think like people are like good. she's my very favorite. Good. She comes across yeah. like pretty charming and stuff. Uh, so she's like – Very progressive. Oh. Yeah, she's, she's very a really progressive. progressive parent. Yeah, but it also says, you know, talks a lot about things that were really difficult in her life and, and it puts her on the page. And when I asked her about it, she said, uh, well, you know, if I'd written a book, it would have been completely different. Like, this is just your, this is how you see me. And that's true. Like, I think that's a very healthy way of looking at it because these are my memories of my family and they are uh, smart enough and kind enough to let me have those memories in the way that I see them and they haven't been upset about it. But I let them read it before because I am desperate for everyone's approval. So I was like, <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Let's say you've been born in Australia and moved to the United States when you were five. Do you think you'd have had enough of a story to fill a book? Oh, if I'd moved to... So the question was, Australia. yeah, if I'd moved from Australia to the United States instead of from Yugoslavia to Australia, would I have had enough of a story to tell? I don't know. I hope so because I, th I always think that storytelling isn't necessarily about the content but about how you tell stories. So I would hope that, that I would find insights and things that had happened in my life and that there was something I wanted to, to talk about. So I think the themes in this book are ones that are particularly interesting to me. So it's about, you know, belonging and identity and family um, – and culture as well and, and immigration. But I, I imagine that there would be other things that would be bothering me that I needed to explore. Yeah. Yeah, and I think to be fair, when people have stories, everybody has stories, like everybody here has a billion stories. What we're also looking for is perceptiveness. And I think Sophia's perceptiveness is actually what makes her storytelling really interesting, is her point of view. And I think that no matter where your background would be, you would have lots of things that you could share with us because we read for entertainment and insight. I think you have an enormous amount of insight. Thank you. <laughs> Very much. I'd just like to comment about women of letters and alienation. I think that it's fabulous and it has such a positive effect connecting um, these stories and it has such a ripple effect. And Aww. my friends and I, Month and I feel like I've grown so much just by hearing all these different stories. Thank you. Thanks for saying that. Yeah. It is. You know, I feel I feel like I have as well. That at each of these shows, we have guests, and they're asked to either write a letter or tell a story from their life. So this alienation, we ask people with immigrant backgrounds um, and women of letters. It's women, but. Every time before the show, I always feel like nervous and stressed and, you know, like, how's it going to go? What's going to happen? And then every single time these individuals who are pers 
perceptive and insightful come up and they tell these amazing stories and I love it. It really inspires me. That's actually the other thing apart from uh, The Moth, what inspires me to write is being in contact and th that's how I actually met Min Jin Lee was one of our uh, guests at Women of Letters. Were you there at that one? She was amazing. She was so good. That was amazing. She was amazing. <laughs> you got a standing over face. Anyway. Anyway, but you get to meet people who are, I get to meet people who are extremely inspiring to me. So that's the other thing about being in New York is that um, I come into contact with people and it makes me feel like I can do it. Because that's another thing that's always, that, that I've always struggled with is thinking like, can, can I do this? Why should, why should I sit down and write something? Why would anyone care? And then uh, meeting other people who do it and being inspired by them is a really big game changer for me. Well, and, and in Women of Letters, you have the other women telling their stories, but you always have one that is always terrific. And Thank you. Terrific. It's wonderful to hear your voice each, each time. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Everyone here is so nice. You know when you were like, oh, what if people like challenge or people are like, I don't agree with you. That's what I was thinking. But no, everyone's really nice. Unless, okay, is there someone? <laughs> No, no, no. Have no. another brandy, please. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So do you know what tall poppy syndrome is, Americans? Tall poppy syndrome is, a, is an Australian thing, which is uh, basically that if someone, if there's all these poppies growing and if one grows too high, you cut them down. So that's like an attitude if someone like shows off too much or if someone says like, I'm an amazing writer, you put them in their place. So like you're bringing people down a notch and that's a very, um, it's in Australia, I think it's, it's British as well that, that that exists, tall poppy syndrome. And uh, so... The question was, do I feel like that it affects me with self-doubt? I think I have had self-doubt forever, but I don't actually think that it's necessarily a bad thing. I think that it um, – sometimes it is, of course, like when I'm just sitting by myself and crying or whatever. <laughs> but I think it also is good because it lets you examine things. I think that if you're just confident about everything you say and think, uh, that's not necessarily healthy. So – I like asking questions and I do that a lot in my writing. I don't think I necessarily come up with answers, but I try, like I kind of shoot at, you know, scattergun, sorry, this approach to, to trying to answer questions um, that I don't necessarily feel confident about, but I think that's part of my style. And, and maybe I'm more confident than I come across. Maybe it's just my manner a little bit as well. Because also, sometimes I think like, why would anyone write a memoir? Why would you do that? What? But then it's like, no, I did, like, I got an agent. I went to a book pub. Like, it wasn't like an accident. Like, I worked pretty hard for this to happen. So it's like, oh, no, I, I doubt myself. But at the same time, like, clearly, I think that I should write a book for some reason. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Hi. Peyton. This is Peyton. She did the illustrations for the front cover of the book. Um, I wanted to know, uh, what's the power of story? Are there any fictional narratives that have influenced you in your life? And can you share them with us? Ooh. That's such a great question. I think the power, I, I think that story is so powerful. And one thing that that makes me think of is when I was a kid and especially when my life was a little bit kind of in flux and I couldn't do much, I really loved reading uh, stories with very sort of heroes who did amazing things. So when I felt like I was particularly powerless and small and this girl who, you know, was having all these struggles, I read books like The Three Musketeers and The Count of Monte Cristo and Around the World. I really liked adventure and I really liked westerns. I loved this book called Winnetou. Has anyone heard of that? Yeah. So it's written by a guy called Karl May, who is a German who's never been to America. But there are uh, westerns about this Apache chief called Winnetou. And what I didn't realise, I thought that he was... And he's white in the film. He's white. Oh, oh no, Old Shatterhand is white. Who is like the main hero, and then and then Winnetou? Oh yeah, maybe he's played by someone white. In by the white. So I've never seen the films. I've only read it. 
You've seen them. But Karl Mai had never even been to America. He'd never even been to America. So I thought all these things that were true, like that in America a delicacy is bear paw, like that people ate But um, We do, actually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think that I really hung on to kind of hero narratives uh, and b- narratives where there was like an outsider character who somehow like overcomes the odds and becomes amazing. So, you know, I like those ones. I'll think of some that aren't as weird. <laughs> I'll share them. Hi. I have a question. Uh, are you planning to have the book in Serbia translated and how involved will you be with that? I wonder, uh, well, okay, so Serbia hasn't expressed interest in buying the book. I think maybe they don't care that much because it's about someone who left and then lived in Australia, so maybe they don't care that much about it. I would definitely like to read it, but I would like someone else to translate it. I can translate from Serbian to English, I think, better than the other way around. And what was the other one? And also the other question is, do you find, I mean, that depends how you're Serbian, is if there are certain things that cannot be expressed in English that you know in Serbian and it was just impossible. Yes. Yes. There are certain um, things that I love in Serbian are like diminutives. So ways of describing things like, um, you know, uh, instead of a hand, like a little hand, we have like words for that, like rukica or rutica and things like that. Or we have... um, uh, also, terms of endearment. So we call someone my soul and things like that that are that are really lovely and romantic in t- sounding to me in Serbian that you can't really translate. Um, so I do think about that or, and expressions we have, like when someone does something that upsets you, we say you've bitten me on the heart. Or like if you want to like take revenge on someone, you say like I will drink his blood, and it sounds really <laughs> intense. Like I realize it sounds really <laughs> intense in English, but we just say it. Normally, you know, we just like say it in conversation. So there are certain after breakfast. <laughs> yeah, so there are certain things that sound hilarious when you translate them, but in our language they don't actually sound. I think people who speak my language will agree with me that that, that it's not as intense. <laughs> and swear and swearing, we have like uh, amazing swear words, expressions that are said with much lightness in my language that are seem very rude in English. <laughs> Yeah. Hi. I, that's a great question. I'm Greek American, and I think I hope for you and to your question of what do you hope for this book. Um, I, I have said a version of what you just said about being Greek, and there are phrases and things. I I bet you that you will have uh, people of many mixed cultures come back to you and say, "Wow, you know, I saw myself." Um, there are certain things that are universal that make us feel understood, that make us feel heard, seen. That's what I think you might accomplish. I hope so, yes. It'll be the Greek American, the Italian American, the whatever. Yes. Because we all have a version of this. Yes. Um, That's where I see this. Yes. Thank you for helping me with, yes, for that previous question. (laughs) That is the crux of it. Yeah. Yeah, I hope that, yeah, that people who have had not necessarily exactly so i don't think that people who read this have to be from ex-yugoslavia or be particularly interested in yugoslavia or the yugoslavian wars so it's not that much about like if you're like oh my god now i have to read about politics and everything it's not that politics heavy like it's fine uh but it it's about that experience of being uh from somewhere else and trying to fit into we launched it in the best city in the world to do it because most of us are like that but yeah. most of us are half something and our identities reside Thank you. Thank you for having two books. Best audience member. She's got two books. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Hi. So the, your book starts uh, with the beauty pageant. Um, and you say you said that you also you know talk about your, like your birth. But I was curious how you decided to structure your memoir, since it's not, I haven't read it yet, I yeah. <laughs> um, but since it's not chronological. So that's the only, so the prologue is the beauty pageant, and then it goes back to before I was born. That bit's a little bit made up, because I wasn't actually there. <laughs> that chapter. But then it's chronological all the way through, and then it ends with the beauty pageant as well. 
So it's just like a flash for, you know, like in films where it's like, ah, and then it's like, how did we get here? It's like that. <laughs> so otherwise it's pretty simple structure. It's, it's very straightforward. So you don't talk about the beauty pageant throughout. It's really just the beginning of the yeah. Well, Sophia has kindly agreed to sign your books, and I know you guys have gotten them. Thank you so much. Thank and you. And I hope that you guys will not only get the book, I hope you'll read it, and I hope you'll share it with other people and talk about it. Because I don't know, for those of you who don't know, between 600,000 to 1 million books are published every year. Oh, my God. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> That's so many books. Sophia didn't know either. <laughs> so if you like it, please tell other people. Because that's how we can share and grow our communities of readers. Because that's how we become really powerful. So thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you.